quite a few different states. Um, and uh, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to give this presentation, a great presentation that I got to see at the uh, AFWA meeting. And thank you, Elsa, for, uh, for handling all the logistics. Um, so folks, if you can, you know, there's a, there was a link in my email to an Adobe Connect site, so go ahead and link into that. It's best if you use Internet Explorer, you might have some trouble with, uh, with Chrome. But um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Mike. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Mark. Mike, this is Elsa. Before you jump in, I wanted to give a quick overview of Adobe Connect for those of you viewing from afar. If you go to the top of the screen in the gray header, there is a, a, a box that says full screen with four arrows. You can click on that, and it will pop your, box, your screen out. You'll see the full PowerPoint. You also have the ability above that, those arrows to raise your hand at any point. Um, and you have a chat box, which you won't be able to see when you go to full screen, but um, you, we're going to want you to hold your questions, and if you have some and you're afraid to, you'll lose them, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box there at the bottom. And so I think that's all the basic instruction you need at this point, Mike, if you want to take it away. And again, thanks from everybody, I think. No, thank you all for the opportunity. And Elsa, is, can you see the PowerPoint now on the screen? Is it all set to go? Yes, it's good to go. Excellent. Hopefully everybody else does as well. Yeah. It would be boring to hear just my voice, I, I guarantee. But I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about this project. And I want to do basically four, four things today. And the first is uh, just give a little bit of an introduction of the study, the team that was involved and the methods we used. And the methods we used. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. Um, there's a problem, a technological problem here. Yeah, could everybody just put their phone on mute? And also, if you're looking on the Adobe, there is a small uh, speaker icon on the upper left. Make sure that is white and your speakers are muted. Should we try again? Yes, it sounds like hopefully everybody got that. Okay, thank you. So four things, introduce the, the study team and methods. Second thing, and this is real important to us, I want to provide uh, the conceptual background, background that, and, and the, the explanation we have for why values are shifting, because within that context, uh, the data have much more meaning. Well, the third thing I want to do is then review some of the highlights of the findings, and then lastly, uh, have a, a dialogue Q&A period uh, if you are interested. So let's start and, and, and get going on the study team. Um, it's a, it was a big uh, productive group, and I'll thank them all. Their names are on the screen right now. I'm joined today by Dr. Tara Teal, who is my lead PI on this, and Andrew Don Carlos, who was the project manager, um, who can answer questions uh, when I can't. So, that's the team, and I, when I talk today, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to use data from really three different sources. The first is the 2004 Wildlife Values in the West study that involved 19 states at an N of uh, 12,000. 12, and then, of course, more recently, we did two types of data collection. The, the one is the American Wildlife Values Survey, which was all 50 states. Uh, replicating quite a bit of what we did in, in 2004. Then we also did an agency culture survey uh, open to all agencies, 28 participated, and we have data from, from that. Now, um, I don't want to talk a great deal about methods. If we get into that, that's fine afterwards. We did a lot of pre-testing uh, uh, to determine how we should approach the American Wildlife Values Study. Um, we compared, for example, mail, email, and phone. We ended up using a mail survey, and then the response rate wasn't what we wanted it to be, and we, so we supplemented with email panels. And we supplemented with email panels based on the pretest that showed very similar results between mail and email. We ended up with an, a, a sample size of 43,949 people. Agency culture survey, we uh, used an email administration, got a great response rate of 68% and almost 10,000 subjects. In all these cases, we're using a survey, 
self-report survey uh, where we ask people questions and then analyze responses. So let me talk a little bit about context and background for what we're doing. I, I mean, there's no doubt that the, the problems that confront wildlife management today are, are difficult, um, whether it's human-wildlife conflict or, or endangered species, uh, or the big one, which is the decline in hunter numbers, and then that, that, ha that um, complicates things in terms of funding. And then the question of, about how do you reach out to new audiences or, or how do you recruit hunters becomes a big issue. So these are really daunting issues. And for us, um, as we look at that, um, these, these are issues that are rooted in, in culture shift. And they're, they're, they're deep-rooted deep, deep uh, social issues, which is reflected in social values that people have. Let me give just a, a little bit of a description of what my, I mean by social values. Um, values are these deep-seated motivational goals that direct broad patterns of behavior that people have. They're formed very early in life. They don't change within an individual over time. They do change at a state level, which I'm going to talk about later. Values. Aren't, aren't something you learn in a brochure. They're embedded in virtually everything around us, the, what, the way we talk, the stories we tell, um, material culture, the, the, the technology we have. It's everywhere around us. And they're useful from an evolutionary standpoint because they adapt us to our social and environmental world. Now, there's been a lot of work on values globally and in the United States. And it's widely recognized that domination is the defining value in America that orients people to, to their natural environment. Um, it is thought to have emanated at the time of the Reformation, and it's deeply in, in, embodied in religion. Here's a quote from Genesis that says it quite directly. Um, the, the thing that has made it such a, a dominion and domination, such a powerful force for uh, Anglo, North, well, European and North American culture is that it wasn't just you were told to do it in the Bible. It, it is that you would gain salvation from domination. And so, as I said, it was a very powerful force in driving exploration, domination, colonization in America very rapidly. And of course, we all know it had ultimately negative effects in the over-harvest of certain species and extirpation and extermination of, of, of species. And um, that happened as a result of the sense that there was an endless bounty that, to be dominated. From that, emanated conservation, which is a utilitarian or domination solution to these problems. I'm going to I'm going to confuse you a little bit. I hope not, actually, because I'm going to use the term utilitarian as a substitute for domination. And then later, I'm going to call it traditionalism. Those are all the same thing in our view. So conservation was the solution to, to these problems arose in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and leaders like Aldo Leopold advanced uh, uh, this utilitarian conservation philosophy that emphasized sustained production and utility of resources. Science would be the basis of decisions, and managers would be trained in, in science, and therefore the best people to make decisions. A very, a very powerful and very effective model that has resulted in kind of where we are today with amazing uh, management of fish and wildlife uh, in, in, the, in North America. Interesting along the way, interesting things happen to American uh, streams of thought. And so I depict it here with this, this cartoonish character, but think of the, the rivers, uh, the streams as rivers of thought. And on one side, we'll just put utilitarian, on the other, more of a protection orientation. And you can see um, prior to World War II, these were the dominant ways of viewing uh, our relationship with natural resources, mostly utilitarian, mostly a domination view. But post-World War II, 
interesting things happen, as is depicted in that top scene of modernization. Modernization being increased wealth, urbanization, and education is key indicators. And it had a dramatic change in how people thought about, about the, the natural environment and wildlife in particular. Interesting, there's a guy, uh, Ron Engelhardt, very famous uh, political scientist, who introduced the idea that needs changed in that time period, and he used Maslow's hierarchy as the example. And he said, prior to World War II, uh, the focus was on safety and security and, and just subsistence needs, and therefore the values that we held were largely materialistic and focused on how to meet those needs. After World War II, things changed quite a bit, and, 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 and in a Maslowian way, the focus on subsistence, safety, security needs were already met. People were brought up without those being concerns, and they moved on to higher order needs like belongingness, love, self-expression. And this has been the main driver in what has changed values across the globe, and his data show it across the globe. So it's in that context that we introduced the idea, and not directly as Engelhardt did, but we proposed that modernization, these forces of change, remove people from risk and contact with wildlife. They change the interaction. Um, they increase the tendency toward anthropomorphizing. And this gave rise to mutualist values. So now I've just introduced this term, mutualist values. Let me tell you the two dimensions that we measured in the survey and that we talk about. And the first one is that utilitarian domination dimension. And in that context, people see wildlife as subordinate. And they should be used in ways that benefit humans. Research, hunting are two examples of that. Um, wildlife should be eliminated if they threaten safety or we should be eliminated to protect private property. And there would be this vision where wildlife um, in the future, there's abundant populations for hunting and fishing or whatever uses we deem appropriate. The mutualist uh, value dimension is the opposite one, which I just described. And in that, wildlife are seen as part of an extended social network. Uh, of a person's life. Wildlife are viewed often as family or companions. Um, people wish to care for wildlife as they might for humans. They're deserving of rights like humans. And there's this vision of humans and wildlife uh, living side by side without fear. So when I pose these two alternative visions, um, I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong. I'm saying this is how the public thinks. So I gave you a bit of a background. Let me put that together in a formal model for you, because after this I'm going to talk about the results in the context of that model. So after World War II, modernization, uh, and particularly things like increased wealth and urbanization and education, provided a shift in a social ecological context. It affected several three, uh, key things to the individual. It removed wildlife from their daily life, uh, unblocked anthropomorphic thinking, and I also mentioned that it increased, increased this need for affiliation and self-expression. Self this provided the impetus toward uh, a shift toward mutualist wildlife values. And it had emergent effects, which are the things that wildlife agencies ended up dealing with. Attitude shift, increased conflict, advocacy group formation uh, as a fulfillment of self-expression when governments weren't doing that anymore and um, the pressure on govern governance institutions. Um, this resulted then in population level value shift. And here's where I want to bring out the point that I'm going to talk a lot about population level value shift. And the things that affect that are a little different than what affect the individual. And what I have here is a multi-level model that has individual effects, but also cultural level effects. And the things that affect a popular, like a state level composition of values would be things like migration and then intergenerational replacement, because I said um, values don't change within a, a person's life, but they do change over generations. Okay, there's the model. Here's what I'm going to talk to you about now.
First, I'm going to talk to you about how modernization has had an effect or is associated with population level value shift at the state level. Next, I'm going to talk to you about and give evidence that there has been a shift toward mutualist wildlife values. Then I want to briefly show you that anthropomorphic thinking seems to be associated with that. And then the thing I think that will be most meaningful to you is to look at the effect on attitudes and um, on conflict and, and agencies. So here we go. Let's start with me first to saying to you, I'm even going to take those value dimensions and compress them a bit more so they're a bit more meaningful. So I'm going to have four types of value people that I talk about. One is high on utilitarian uh, values, low on mutualism. They're traditionalists. Mutualists are high on mutualism, low on utilitarian. Pluralists are high on both, and I'm not going to talk very much about them, but distanced are low on both. So those are the four types. I'm going to talk mostly about the first two. So here are the proportion of traditionalists by state in the U.S. And you'll notice an in intriguing uh, diagonal from Montana to the southeast that is the core of traditionalists, higher proportions of traditionalists. And if you extend that out, you go all the way to Alaska, which is also high. Then on the op opposite corners of the U.S. Northeast and in the Southwest, you see uh, much lower proportions of traditionalists. Um, as I show you the map of mutualists, you're going to see the reverse of that, with the exception of Florida pops out as having a high proportion of mutualists. And again, if you extend out to Hawaii, you have high proportions of mutualists there and low in Alaska. So you all have your favorite state, and you can take a look at that. And by the way, this gives me the opportunity to say, you know, I am talking about the national level analysis, and we are doing reports for each state that are in progress. Some states have theirs already, but others will get theirs probably by the end of this month is the plan. Okay, first thing I said is that modernization is giving rise to mutualist values. What, what is my support for that? So I have a couple to show you here. A couple, remember I said it's indicated modernization by income, wealth, education, and urbanization. I have a couple of those slides to show you. And I want to point out to you what's unique about what we're able to do with this multi-state study is we're able to do this state-level analysis. And this graph shows you the relationship between, on the x-axis, the percent of traditionalists in a state, and then on the y-axis, the percent with income above the national mode. And you can see this uh, negative relationship that the higher the income, the less likely there is traditionalist in the state, proportion of traditionalist. And so, so at the far end of the curve are, are North Dakota, Wyoming, and South Dakota. And then on the left side, you'll see at the top uh, Connecticut and California, et cetera. So this, this, this is the, why does the country look the way it does? Why does the value composition look the way it does? in the U.S., here are the answers that, that we have. Here's an example of urbanization. And this shows the percent mutualists in the state uh, on the x-axis, and then the percent living in a mid to large city on the y-axis. And here you see this positive relationship. I'll point out to you that the Northeast was a little different in how people responded to it because of the high density and how people perceive themselves as living in a large city or not. And so we pull those out as a separate sort of analysis. As you can see, coastal northeast is different than the rest of the US. But they all show the same thing, that as urbanization increases, so does the percent of mutualists in the state. So there's the two pieces of evidence. And I, I could show you a lot more of these kinds of graphs, but I promise you they're going to show you all the same thing Education is going to show you the same thing. And this is our evidence that modernization is having this, this effect on wildlife values. Now the question is, we show this cross-sectional 
uh, analysis, like I just showed you, that seems to support what we're saying. But what evidence is there that values are actually changing? Well, fortunately, we can we can compare the 2004 data to 2018. Um, and in this in, in in this map, what I'm showing you is the rate of change. It's not the absolute change. So you know, if you go from from 10% to 15, that's a 50% increase. Just so you're clear of how I'm. I'm talking about this, but it's fascinating because here's the percent of traditionalist rate of change. And you can see in California, Arizona, Nevada, um, you can see a rather abrupt shift um, in, in, in a rate of change uh, away from traditionalism. The two states that have slight gains would be North Dakota and Wyoming. We suspect that's due to migration effects, um, which we haven't had a chance to really look at. But you can see most states actually have a decline, a rate of change of decline in traditionalists. Here, as we, you might expect, is the rate of change for mutualists. And the South Dakota one, you're going to look at and say 50%. I, I think that's because it went from something like 17% to the mid-20s. So. It's not like everyone in South Dakota is a mutualist now, but it does show a rather abrupt uh, rate of change. But in most of the states, you do see a rate of change that shows an increase in mutualism uh, rather abruptly. And then I'm showing just one more on rate of change, which I, I found, we here found, kind of interesting, which is the rate of change of increase in the distance value types, really strong in Idaho and Texas, and some of those intermountain states uh, were pretty high. So anyway, we, we see in a rather, this would be a, a pretty short time period from a value shift standpoint. Um, we see some evidence of change. In terms of absolute change, uh, what we saw was uh, across all the states, uh, an actual, and this isn't rate of change, actual 5% increase in mutualism, a 5% uh, decrease in traditionalists. So now I mentioned the anthropomorphizing about wildlife is a, a really essential, essential ingredient. Um, we feel like unless there was some stimulus to create change, that modernization alone wouldn't have done it. So we feel like there was this unique part to this that made wildlife values change rather abruptly, and that's this tendency to see human characteristics in, in wildlife. And so here's the relationship we see. First of all, I, I want to say, and I don't have a graph on this, the, the correlation at the individual level, not this state level that I'm showing you, but the correlation at the individual level is very strong between mutualism and anthropomorphism. And, and another thing I want to mention is the way we measured anthropomorphism was a, a, a three-item scale um, that we took from the psychology literature, wasn't developed by us, that's been used in many other cases um, that ask people questions such as, do animals have intention? It just, there's, a, there's a several questions about that. So having said that, when I look at the state level, you can see that and I'm back on this graph now, that the percent mutualist in a state, as that increases, so does the percent who exhibit a tendency to anthropomorphize wildlife, that is, project human characteristics on, on, onto wildlife. So that supports, again, a piece of, of, the, of our model. Now, the part that perhaps you'll have the, the most interested in is how it affects attitudes perceptions of the agency and wildlife associated uh, recreation behavior. This graph, we, we asked a number of questions about uh, predators and how you think predators should be controlled. This graph shows the relationship between the percent mutualists in a state and the percent in a state that agree that coyotes should be killed uh, if they kill pets in a residential area. And 
I, I just have to point out to you that rarely do we find results so perfect and tightly aligned as this graph shows. You can see really clearly that if you go to the left-hand side, uh, Mississippi, North Dakota, for example, very supportive of killing a coyote that kills a pet. Just the opposite as you look at the far right-hand side of the curve with Nevada, Rhode Island, and, and California. And so it's pretty clear that the percent mutualists in the state, uh, as an indicator of culture shift, suggests a really important impact on how people respond to wildlife issues. Here's another one that looks at how, whether or not the people in a state trust the fish and, their state fish and wildlife agency. And I do have to point out to you that trust in state fish and wildlife agencies is way above federal government and state government. I don't have that graph in here. We'll have it in the final report. So we're dealing on sort of the positive side of trust to begin with. But we do see that the more mutualists in a state, the lower the, the trust in the state wildlife agency, going from like North, North Dakota that's in the 75-80 range down to the 55-60 range in California. That's a substantial drop and change. Now, you might think, because we had a similar result to this in the 2004 study, you might think, well, this is simple. The more mutualist in a state, the more likely you're going to have distrust. But that's not what it was. And we were, we were really surprised to find, and we actually published an article on this in Biological Conservation from the 2004 data that showed the real thing that happens is the decline in trust amongst the traditional group. And so what I have here is the percent mutualists in the state on the X uh, axis. And then I have, again, the trust in the agency. And what I've done is, for all the states, done two lines. One is just for the traditionalists in the state, and the other is just for mutualists in the state. And there's no relationship across the mutualists. In other words, they're lower than traditionalist, and, but it doesn't change if the state becomes more mutualist. But you do see this drop in trust in the agency from traditionalists. And I guess that probably isn't a surprise for folks thinking about the difficulty of making change when you start to have what we call the cultural backlash from the traditional clientele. So I know uh, funding is an issue. I put in this, this graph that shows, uh, again, this is like an item that we asked in 2004, asks about how people would like to see fish and wildlife managed and by what source of funding. And you see clearly the mode uh, and majority feel it should be fishing license fees, hunting fishing license fees, and taxes. And then, then there's sort of a tailing off on either side. I, I want to point out to you also, which I don't show, that the preponderance of people also believe that's what's current, currently going on, just so you know that. One interesting thing when we looked at, at the value shift hypothesis to see you know, what, what might be going on in terms of as states become more mutualist, are they more uh, supportive of a taxation situation? And, and, it, and it was a slight increase. It, it goes from the tens to the 25% range at the top. And you can see that here. I've got percent mutualists by. And, and this is just the top three categories that pr prioritize public taxes. It's not even the, the, the modal category where there's a split. So in, th this would be there's a, a, a favoring pri priority on taxes. And you, you see it does increase. So the presumption is that in more mutualist state, there's more support for tax, uh, taxation for fish and wildlife management. Now related, of course, to the, to, the hunting, uh, to the funding situation is the hunting situation and the decline in hunting participation. So what we looked at was to see what would be the cultural effect of, a, of a, a state becoming more mutualist, because the mutualist, remember, is just an indicator of a changing culture in a state. And so 
so we looked at the percent mutualists in the state by the percent of active hunters. And so what do I mean by, by active hunters? We took all hunters, the people that said they hunted ever, and then we looked at the people that hunted just in the last 12 months and used the first as a denominator and just got the rate of activism. So it's how many of all hunters hunted in the last 12 months. And you can see a rather abrupt um, decline of percentages here, down to well below 5% in California, Rhode Island, Nevada. I mean, it's not that past hunters aren't there, it's that the people that used to hunt just don't have the cultural support, the social environment, et cetera, that happens in mutual estate that foster their participation. So let me change my attention to the agency survey and then just start by saying the agencies haven't been changing so much, slow to change, not changing, that's splitting hairs, but let me give you what, what we found there. Um, first, it's important, our research shows really clearly that there's a, a coherence, a unity of purpose in the agency. I think it's a unity in, in agencies. It's a unity and purpose that most agents, organizations would die for. And these are the, the, the values that we found. I've co collapsed them into a core of the things that really define the values of the agency. They see themselves as experts for wildlife, about wildlife, enforcers of wildlife law, showing compassion toward wildlife. They're advocates for wildlife when there's a threat to wildlife and protectors of wildlife. It's a really strong um, affiliation. The two that we found really interesting is that, one, a, uh, employees felt strongly that it was important to uphold the values of the agency, and two, they wanted to be a model employee. And so these are percentage, really high percentages, over 80% across all the agencies. And, it's, I think what we would have expected, there's a strong cohesion in that agency. Now, I'll tell you right now, we didn't see any of a relationship between the rise in mutualism and, and agencies and agency response. I'll tell you that now. And we did, though, look a little deeper at how we could characterize agencies uh, differently because there are differences. And um, here's how we went about it. Um, we categorized agencies into two basic, basically governance model models. One's what we refer to as an expert model, and the other is the client or clientele model. And we used the, the items that I've got on the screen were uh, bipolar. In other words, we'd ask people, what does your agency place more, more priority on, politics or science, innovation or tradition? meeting the needs of wildlife, meeting the needs of the public, including all members of the public, including stakeholders, protecting habitat, providing recreation, focusing on the future, focusing on the present, and being proactive or being uh, reactive. And so for the 28 states that participated, um, here's how they fell out. And so obviously, it's, all, it's not all black or white, as you can see. In Massachusetts, the preponderance of people felt they represented more of an expert model, and Ohio and Connecticut, uh, more of a client clientele model. And so, you know, you can see, though, a pretty, uh, agencies are quite divided and could readily be classified at least at the top and, and the bottom. And so what we did was took a look at how that might affect um, other characteristics of the agency. So one of the things we looked at is the percent who viewed their agency um, as accountable. And then we just looked at whether they, the percent that felt they had an expert model of management. And you could see a really strong relationship the more uh, the expert model, the more they felt accountable, uh, that the agency was being accountable. Um, 
this was also interesting, the percent that believe the general public should be more involved in decision making. And as you probably would expect, the clientele model had a higher percentage of people that felt that way, um, which would be like Connecticut and Ohio. And the people, that, the agencies that were more of the expert model felt that less likely that the general public should be involved in decision making. So I don't know if I have, I have just a couple more things for, for us that were sort of important and um, in comparison of the agency um, to stakeholders. And, and this is one, now I want to say that this varies by state and I'm just going to show you the national level comparison of value orientations within the agency as opposed to value orientations in the nation. Um, and so you see, as you probably would expect, a high proportion of traditionalists uh, within the agencies, which is the blue, and then uh, a much lower half or so in the public at large. And then if you look over at the mutualist category, of course there's many more mutualists in the public than there are in the agencies. And then, of course, you would probably expect that there's a difference with the distance. There are a lot of distance folks in the agency. So it's pretty clear there's a, and it's, I can tell you right now, in, in the states that are more mutualist, the gaps are greater um, because the agencies uh, aren't reflecting, not that they should, but they, they certainly are different than the publics that they serve. A couple final slides when we think about the audience uh, to be served in the future. Um, we, we had an unusual opportunity because of the way we sampled. We wanted to make sure that we had good representation from underrepresented uh, classes in the U.S. And so we had targeted sample on Hispanics, Asians, African Americans, and Native Americans. And so this is pretty interesting because it shows the percent of traditionalists by ethnic category, race category. And among a third uh, that are traditionalists, and less than half of that for Hispanics and Asians, and then less for all the other categories, but less of a contrast for African Americans and Native Americans. Um, when you look at that for mutualists, um, you see that Hispanics and Asians are r really strongly represented in the mutualist category. Um, and uh, again, you know, black Native Americans tend to look a bit more like the Anglo than for Hispanics and Asians. So, I mean, from our standpoint, it would be an, an intriguing prospect to understand more of what these growing underrepresented uh, stakeholders are interested in. So the full report, I, I, I put it up here like it's available, but it's not. It's going to be available in uh, mid-October. We'll post it and undoubtedly send around an email to all that are interested. And that's what I've got. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know if I even went over or not. Uh, a little over. So. I don't know, Elsa, how you want to handle questions, but I'm available for them if you have them. So thank you, Mike. This is really amazing. We have a few, um, a few, two, two options for people. You can write questions in the chat box, or you can go up to the top of the screen and raise your hand, and we'll be monitoring that and call on people to to speak um, verbally as well. It looks like. Um, we have a couple of comments in the in the chat. One from Dan Browning. Um, the biggest question may be, can we receive a copy of this presentation? I, I think you recorded it, did you not? Yes. Oh. Hopefully, hopefully we recorded it. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, I, we we are going to post these presentations. We haven't yet. We're playing a little bit of catch up, trying to get these state reports done. But yeah, we can post this. Absolutely. Great. And then the next um, question, and there was a couple people who seconded that. Um, someone who wants to see the director see it. The director see it at the national meeting. Um, 
Were the, another question from Harry Crockett, were the non-participating agencies asked why they didn't participate? Apologies if that was reported and he missed it. No, no, we didn't, we didn't ask that. I, 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 yeah, we're, we're not sure about that one. But I, I will point out that we've had a couple states say they're, they're interested and uh, we're unfortunately probably going to have to charge for the added part this time around because Thank you. We're we're out of money. <laughs> yeah, the project's come to an end, so it won't be it won't be very much, but just to cover the graduate student that's working on it. We could do okay. that through Aqua. We can make that announcement through Aqua. And and just a reminder, if you have a question, the little icon there's a a, a person in the black at the very top with its hands raised. If you click on the down arrow, you can raise your hand. Um, and I know Sunny's got a, a question. I'll read that and then Mike Harris. So Sunny said, who were the surveys sent to within a state agency to answer on behalf of the agency? Everyone, Every, everyone that was full time. And then um, some agencies had parks and various other groups associated with that. So our analysis pulled out those people and focused on fish and, and wildlife managers. Yeah, it wasn't temps though. Temps weren't weren't in, invited to participate. Okay, Mike, if you want to unmute yourself and ask um, Mike the question, Mike Harris, ask Mike Manfredo. Yeah, I wondered if you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, did you survey any boards or commissions, the policy making parts of the agency separate from the employees? Well, that's a, I don't think commissions were included in the agency survey. That's a great question and, and I'll have to find out. My, my initial response is no, but yeah, I, I don't think we did. Didn't think of that one. Okay, I see a few more uh, folks typing in, but no more hands raised. Feel free to also raise your hand if you'd like to ask the question over the phone. Looks like uh, Junko has raised her hand. Go ahead, Junko. Hi, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I have a question. Um, I noticed um, there is a higher percentage of how do you say that? anthropomorphization. <laughs> um, maybe I just maybe bi was biased, but um, in Alaska and Hawaii, in both opposite end, but it was debarred from the you know um, average. And so um, I'm wondering if you did any analysis about the inference from a traditional uh, knowledge. No. You know, some state has more traditional knowledge inference than other states. Um, you know, that's a that's a great question, and 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 we got some comments back after the survey, and and I have to admit that. Um, no, let me back up. We've we've done the assessment of these wildlife values in a global context. We've done it in Europe. We've done it in Africa. And I have to say, in in certain contexts, it doesn't capture the complexity of what happens in uh, native populations uh, uh, in both Alaska and Hawaii. Likely, more it was more obvious to us in in Alaska that we got the comment back mm -hmm. that just that it, it so you raise a good point and I don't feel like we represent very adequately the complexity uh, of those values uh, among, amongst native populations particularly in, in Alaska and I should point out the the Native Americans were so interesting in the the one graph that I showed you um, about their value orientation I didn't show them all but the Native Americans showed up so interestingly, they were more likely pluralists, but they were also much more likely to have hunted and fished 
and have interest mm -hmm. in future mm -hmm. hunting and fishing. So there, mm -hmm. there's, yeah, you raise a great question, and I'll say it was a study limitation. How's that? Okay. Uh, it, it's very interesting for me. And I came from actually um, traditional, I mean, Asian community. So <laughs> this was another twist. And um, yeah, thank you for that racial um, and cultural. Aspect of analysis too. Well, thank you for your comment. Yeah, thanks. I, I saw a few people typing comments in, but it seems like they've disappeared or Maybe they're still typing. Um, any other? Questions? Anybody want to raise their hand and, and, and uh, ask uh, Mike a question on, over the phone? Looks like Mark has written. And, um, actually, there's a couple of questions. Um, Amanda, was there any analysis of influence of socioeconomic status status and or urban rural location with respect to the trends uncovered for race. Uh, let's see, was the analysis of the influence of Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did look at that, as a matter of fact. And the issue of race is in intertwined with social economic status. We, we actually did 
uh, we controlled for uh, social economic uh, social economic status. and then did an analysis on race. 